Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and our show is Life Along the Merrimack. It is heard on local radio, 96.3 FM, and seen on local TV on Comcast. And in, a link is sent to organizations interested in the river. So the goal here is to talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. I'm a former journalist and covered the waterfront front for the Daily News here in Newburyport. And on this show, we talk about some of the activities that are going on. Um, a lot of people are concerned that the river is getting dirtier, not cleaner. And um, this happens after heavy rainfalls, when some of the sewage treatment plants upriver are overwhelmed because they get sewage in their apparatus, they get rainwater, and they just have too much liquid. So frequently, effluent or sewage goes uh, straight into the Merrimack River. That is not a good thing. And so one of the things that we do here is talk about the health of the river. And, you know, I don't have a guest today, and the reason for that is sometime I go out and report things. I go to environmental summits or I talk with uh, lawmakers, uh, as I was a reporter, as you all recall. So I'm trying to bring some information uh, to the table here. Um, this week, on Monday, I logged into a webinar uh, hosted by the New England Office of the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. Now, the EPA is a big deal. <laughs> we know that. Um, and it really ramped up in the early 70s when uh, Governor Ed Muskie of Maine, uh, Senator Ted, uh, well, he was a governor, Senator Ed Muskie of Maine, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts, put together the Clean Water Act. And much of the changes and improvement came through the EPA. So the EPA has, uh, here in New England, has been made aware uh, of the frequent sewage um, discharges here in the Merrimack. And they have put together some data on this. Everyone's working together. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way. But numerous organizations are working together to make uh, the river cleaner. And there are several um, elements that came from this webinar. And I think, um, you know, I'll just define a web webinar. It's when you, um, the organization, you know, has its own um, starting point and they give out uh, numbers, and you sign in and sign on to the webinar. So you're on online. You go to a, you know, a URL, and you see the information and hear the information that they're putting out. So rather than bringing several hundred people together, as frequently happens uh, with summits, um, they are acting from one place disseminating a lot of information, and uh, I was able to sign into that. One of the takeaways I had uh, from the data that they presented is that the biggest offenders here in the Merrimack Valley are Manchester, Lowell, and Haverhill. Uh, they're large cities, of course, but they're also cities that hook in both their uh, sewage pipes with the water rain-off pipes. So in a heavy rainstorm, as we've said, the sewage goes into the sewage treatment plant, rainwater goes into the same plant, and the plant can't handle all that effluent and all that water. So they have a discharge, and that's how we have raw sewage going into the river. So these three communities um, are, I wouldn't call it guilty, <laughs> because they're aware of what they're doing. And, you know, they're professionals who run it, and they're trying to do the best they can. But these are communities that have to uh, take a better focus on what they're doing. Um, and when you have Manchester, for instance, that's obviously in New Hampshire. So you don't have the same state officials as you do here in Massachusetts trying to get them uh, to come to the table and make improvements. This has been happening for a long time, and these sewage outflows, CSOs they're called, uh, are the things that put raw sewage in. And you know, something actually very interesting happened last weekend. The Merrimack uh, River um, 
uh, so, uh, Sewage Council and the um, the organization actually put out a the the Watershed Council actually put out um, a press release and a warning of not to go into the river. Now this was for June twenty second and twenty third, which we just uh, finished with, because there's heavy rain that week, and this is very unusual. It does link up several points, though, because the sewage treatment plant owners and managers say, you know, we're not public health officers. We'll tell people in a few days that this has happened, but this is not what we do in life is to say we've had a sewage discharge, look out below, and by below I mean downstream. But this is what happened this week. The Watershed Council was able to find out that several uh, major dischargers upriver had, had let a lot of raw sewage into the river, and they had a press release, and it was in local newspapers and on local radio and on websites. And it basically said, there's a lot of bacteria this weekend. Don't let your children, go, don't go swimming. You know, don't let your pets into the water. And for the first time that I'm aware of, um, we had a middleman. And by that, I mean um, someone who became aware, and this is the Watershed Council, and John McCone, who is the acting director there, has been on this show and has talked about it. He's a former editor of the Daily News here in Newburyport. But, you know, he had a press release and said, look, there's a lot of effluent, a lot of bacteria coming down this weekend. Don't go in the water. So that, in my view, was a good thing. Um, the Merrimack River, as glorious it is, is one of the, um, a river in very bad shape in a national basis. The, you know, the EPA that we just talked about, New England branch, has said that, that we're in the top 20 of rivers that are vulnerable. We're vulnerable for the sewage. Also, uh, they're concerned about the runoff, um, as there's more development upriver, uh, there's fewer trees, fewer swamps, less marsh. And so you're getting a lot of runoff um, from, say, a shopping center or a highway. You know, there's oil, there's gas, there's impurities. And so also for that river, um, observers are concerned about the Merrimack. Now, of course, we all love the Merrimack. That's, this is one of the great assets of this area. And we're actually... When we talk about the development on the Merrimack River, we're actually coming up to two centuries. It's said that the beginning of mill life and hydropower in Lowell and Lawrence was about 1822. So we're actually coming up on two centuries of um, having industry on the river, having pollution in the river. Um, of course, the mills of Lowell and Lawrence and Haverhill and Manchester, many of these, in the old days, 19th century, just discharge, you know, effluent into the river. The river was orange. It was green. It was um, terrible things were bobbing around there. Now, sometimes terrible things continue to bob around. And in our era, we actually have syringes from drug users. Uh, they don't bob around, but they do get into the river. It's rather uh, of great concern. But again, that's why we're here. And another thing that was brought out at the APA um, webinar was that efforts are being made to bring serious money into this equation. Um, con congressional representatives, you used to call them congressmen, all right, Congresswoman Lori Trahan of Lowell and Congressman Seth Moulton of the North Shore have both signed on to a, a $500 million request for federal funds to begin reworking the systems in Lowell, Lawrence, and Haverhill. And by that, we mean separating uh, the sewage pipes from the water pipes. So if you had a big rain, the water would um, go through the water pipes and into the river. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than having it go into the sewage treatment plant. So even though at times we think that uh, the river is not under great duress, which it is, um, Things are being done, and this includes uh, not long ago I came back and talked about the creation of the Merrimack River Commission, where municipal, state, federal officials are getting with um, 
environmental leaders, and they're all working together to see what can be done to uh, make a cleaner river. So things are happening. We're reporting them here on Life Along the Merrimack. And um, it was uh, an interesting webinar. Um, one of the elements over the last week uh, that I was involved in as well is I went on a boat trip on the Merrimack River on Saturday. I went with Captain Bill Tapley. Uh, he was on the show several weeks ago. He's a captain of a small vessel, 24 feet, uh, called the Coastie. It used to be a lifeboat on a large Coast Guard vessel. He bought it from the Coast Guard. I must have been a lot of paperwork, I've got to say. And it holds six to eight. So we went out on the river, and it was interesting just seeing life along the river. Saturday was a beautiful sunny day, as you may recall. So there were a lot of fishermen upriver. Now, usually they probably go to the other end towards the ocean or onto the ocean. I'm talking party boats. Some, a boat like the Charles uh, Lively Lady boat might have 40 fish, fishermen. And um, they would be either at the mouth of the river or they'd be uh, in the ocean itself. However, it was very windy. It was very choppy. So several of these fishing boats were in the river. Uh, rather than out on the ocean. But it was very encouraging to see them because they were all catching fish. And the stripers were running. And almost every boat, and we must have passed 20 to 30 uh, boats, was pulling up a striper. And in the old days, uh, people such as myself used to catch uh, schoolies. Those are 14 to 20 inch stripers. You catch four or five and you go home. In my case, I fished on the Saco River in Maine and um, it was good fishing. No one overfished in those days. But about two decades ago, uh, striped bass started disappearing, or at least in large numbers. And so federal officials um, actually um, decided to make new laws, which made it uh, the ca a fish has to be 28 inches long, and you can only catch, I think, one. Now, catch and release is bigger than it was. That's helpful. Uh, but people throw uh, fish back nowadays. But even though we hear about challenges on the river, it was very encouraging to see all these people fishing. They were catching fish. They were having a good time. And in every case I saw, uh, they were throwing the fish back. Now, this little trip enables us to see um, a lot of the life in the marsh. Uh, the marsh off the Merrimack River actually is the largest one in New England, uh, 25,000 acres if you count from, um, say, um, the Cape all the way up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's, um, you know, it's what enables fish and, and birds and all sorts of wildlife to thrive. And so we saw egrets, we saw hawks, we saw heron. Um, we saw the nest of an osprey. <clears throat> now, this is technology at work, and I suppose it's a success. They have actually a camera, a little uh, webcam, in the nest of the osprey, uh, right in the marsh, not, you know, right here in Newburyport. And so in the spring, you'll, you know, the osprey will have several eggs there, and the osprey, uh, you know, the hatch, and they'll, it's really a wonderful thing, and to think it's right here. And I used to, you know, one year I just monitored it myself. And it's very interesting to see the eggs appear. And then the little birds would appear and the uh, mother would be feeding them. So that's still operative right here in Newburyport, a webcam for Osprey. So our vessel it took about 60 minutes, the trip with uh, Captain Tapley. Um, we saw, we went up to... Um, Again, because it, it was choppy and very difficult out at the entrance of the river, we went upriver. And, and one of the real um, gifts that we have from the water as well as from land is Maudsley State Park. And so we went up there. That's across from Amesbury, of course. And uh, so that was interesting. And um, back in 1985, I believe, uh, local and state officials work to obtain that. We, we bought it from a private trust, 
And as a result, you, that's almost 500 acres along the Merrimack. It's, it's a great asset. And some of you, if you don't know, there's hiking, there's fishing, there's horseback riding. Uh, in the winter, there's cross-country skiing. It's really a tremendous asset. And um, we're lucky to have, you know, 500-acre state park uh, right here. And so from the river, it looked great. One of the things we do here on Life Along the Merrimack, we talk about the health of the river, and we also talk about the history of the river. Now, I happen to be the outreach historian for the um, local um, Custom House um, Maritime Museum. And one thing I do is write books, and I have a book coming out this winter called um, New England Coast Guard Stories, Remarkable Patriots, and it is about the Coast Guard, uh, the Coast Guard, the birthplace of the Coast Guard is in Newburyport. Newburyport itself was once the greatest boat building community in New England, which means the states uh, during the colonial period, 1790 to 19 to 1810. And so I reach out, as it were, um, and I speak at groups, uh, and I write books. And the other thing I do, I'm on this program um, to outreach and to talk about history as well as the um, health of the river. So one thing I wanted to talk about um, in terms of history is uh, one of the earliest observers of the Merrimack River was Henry David Thoreau. Now, you might know that name from Walden Pond, and he was considered one of the first environmentalists. He would, you know, take uh, camping trips to Maine. He would um, live in the woods. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't an effusive personality, I will say that. One of his closest friends said about him, I can love him, but I can't like him. Okay, so he didn't have much of a personality. <clears throat> he did a lot of writing, though, and we're talking now he lived 1817 to, say, 1867, I'm thinking. And in 1849, he wrote a book called A Week Along the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. Now, he went on a trip with his brother. Uh, it actually, the trip was actually in 1839, but the book was published in 1849. In that interim decade, his brother died of tuberculosis, um, but they had a wonderful time for about a week or two, canoeing, camping. Um, actually, along the, the title is along the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. They spent most of their time in the Concord River, <laughs> I must say. Um, we had adherents of the Merrimack River, but they were mostly on the Concord. They spent a short time in the Merrimack, and in part, I think, um, Thoreau was kind of um, I hate to use the term bummed out. He was displeased because new factories were being built on uh, the Merrimack River. Now, the first factories, as we said, started in 1822 on the Merrimack in Lowell. Um, he would go up to Lowell, though, in this time, which was 1839. And he, you know, could see already that uh, the factories were um, polluting the river, they were uh, putting their own effluent waste products into the river. Uh, they were, you know, changing the contour, the view, contour of the riverside. And he said, you know, this area up near Lowell is a mere wastewater, as it were, um, a poor area bearing little from Lowell to the sea. So he was kind of saying, and this is 1839, that um, the industrialists, who were using hydropower in a big way, um, were making the Mer they're taking the Merrimack for their own. They were mi making money off it. They were hiring people, and of course, in the 19th century, thousands of jobs were created in Lowell and Lawrence and Manchester. Uh, and that is one of um, history's questions that we always wonder about. Uh, they polluted the river, made it unswimmable, undrinkable. And yet, it was a period when there were many immigrants coming to this community, and it provided jobs. I happen to know this because I wrote two books uh, focusing on elements of factory life. Uh, they were about French-Canadian people who worked in factories in Lowell and Lawrence and Manchester. 
in Portland, uh, in Lewiston, Maine, and that type of thing. So I have had many, many hours of studying of the uh, the hydropower of the textile factories in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And um, there's good to be said for both sides. Um, but it was interesting to listen to Thoreau all the way back in that period of time. Again, he took his trip in 1839. He wrote the book in 1849. He did have a funny remark about his, his book, which was, as we say, um, A Week Along the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. He published it himself, and he published about a 1,000 copies. And so after a year or two, Someone asked him how many books he had in his library, and he said, I have about a 1,000 volumes. Unfortunately, about 900 are written by myself. In other words, he did not sell many of that book. More, you know, Later on in life, he sold many. But in this particular case, I think he had a surplus for quite a long time. So another thing that um, I, I want to talk about... Um, is history as it relates to the Coast Guard. And just to reprise what we've got going here, if you just tuned in, I am Dyke Kendrickson, and the show is Life Along the Merrimack. It is heard on local radio, 96.3 FM, and seen on local cable TV, Comcast, seen several times over the weekend. Then the link is available uh, to organizations interested in the river. Incidentally, if you're interested in having me speak at your organization, I will do so without charge because I am the outreach historian for the Maritime Museum. But one of the elements that interests me on the waterfront is the Coast Guard. As I say, I've written a book about the Coast Guard. It's already finished. It's coming out this winter. And, of course, I am impatient, if not actually cranky, that it's not out yet. You know, everything's done. And it's like you finish the term paper and you say, where's my grade? I don't have your grade for three months. <clears throat> At any rate, so the Coast Guard was started here in 1790 because the first vessel was built here. It was uh, the Massachusetts. But the thing I wanted to talk about a little bit today, um, with notable exceptions, women did not play a large role in nautical history or events. It's hard to realize that now for some younger people, maybe even school children. But women did not go out on vessels, really. They were not part of the shipbuilding process, really, other than to be supportive, maybe run a restaurant or um, be involved in um, taking care of other people's children. They did not go out. But we, this was a very large area for the Coast Guard eventually, and females did really begin joining the Coast Guard in the 20th century. Um, in 19, in, during World War I, for instance, which was 1914 to 1918, two 19-year-old uh, twins, Genevieve and Lucille Baker, volunteered to serve the Coast Guard in World War I in Washington, D.C. They were the first women to don a Coast Guard uniform, and they served in the headquarters in Washington. And I write about these things for the website the Coast of the Maritime Museum, which you can look up under Custom House Maritime Museum. Each week I write a different column on the history of the river. And so this is one of the columns that I looked at, women in the Coast Guard. During World War II, which was 1941 to 1945, the Coast Guard recruited women for the, what they call SPARS, and that stood for Semper Paratus, Always Ready. And it's kind of, I wouldn't call it jocular, but it was a light use of uh, an acronym. This is a female corps similar to the Navy's waves and the Army's wax. For the war effort, the Coast Guard um, estimated they would need 8,000 enlisted women and 400 female officers. Well, they actually recruited about 12,000. And this was remarkable because women of this era were patriotic. They were hardworking. They, wa they wanted this opportunity to help the country. And so they um, were support staff in many areas, um, secretaries and clerics. and Not clerics. Cl they did clerical work although they could have been clerics, I imagine. But they did good things. Um, after the war, and, and this you know, is puzzling today in the modern world, um, almost every woman 
left the Coast Guard. So they recruited 12,000. By 1956, the Coast Guard had mustered them out. And there were only a few hundred women in the Coast Guard after having 12,000 in just a decade before. Well, that being said, things moved along. In the 1970s, federal regulations began encouraging women for both officer and enlisted ranks in the Coast Guard. In 1976, the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, began accepting women. During the first year, 700 women applied. And 38 were accepted. Now, if you think getting into college is hard nowadays, I think that's tough. 700 apply, 38 get in. Of the original 38 candidates, um, 14 graduated. You know, in my view, you were great to even get accepted. Uh, To get through the whole thing is amazing. More women have joined each year. In fact, in last year's first-year class at the Coast Guard Academy, almost 40% of the cadets were women. I mean, that is, as you can tell, in 45 years, an enormous growth. Um, Women have excelled in this service and now hold many high posts. They have commanded vessels, and there was a woman superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy several years ago. So they have continued this role, and today um, there are about 6,000 women in the Coast Guard. So we'll, just to review the bidding, there are 42,000 active members of the Coast Guard. About 6,000 of them are women. So it's a small percentage, but quite a bit up from 1956 when you had about 200. In recent years, the Coast Guard has developed a program which permits um, mothers uh, to take a leave of absence for two years. Um, They're trying to encourage women to um, stay with the service if they have children. And I interviewed many women for my upcoming book, and they said um, that it's really helpful to take a couple years off. Um, A lot of the women who were able to juggle being an officer, being a mother, moving, were married to Coast Guard officers or enlisted themselves. So it evidently helps to have a mate who is in the Coast Guard. Uh, One of the most interesting elements, uh, and I'll speak a little quickly here because we're almost finished. Um, One of the people I interviewed for my book was a woman involved. She was a um, captain um, and pilot of a helicopter that was out on the rescue of the bounty. Now, this was a wooden vessel. It came to Newburyport in 2012, um, and in that year, it went from Connecticut to Florida, It got caught in Hurricane Sandy, and the captain made many errors. Um, I won't go into them, but let us say the vessel was going off, going down in the Atlantic, about 70 miles off um, of North Carolina. So one of the women I interviewed from the book, Jane Pena, was a pilot, and so they got the call. Uh, They, you know, get ready to go out. Uh, She's in North Carolina itself. They get into the chopper. They they have the position of the vessel which is going down. And I said, what was the first thing you thought of when, you know, you were roused at 5 a.m. There's a hurricane, 60 knot winds, the seas are high. And she said, well, we didn't, we looked online. We didn't know what the vessel looked like. The bounty, no one had heard of it. So imagine this, it's 5 a.m., you're happily sleeping in a hurricane, and they go out and um, had to rescue um, vet people on the vessel. And it was one of the Coast Guard's most successful ventures. There was a crew of 14 on the bounty. They rescued, no, there were four, they rescued 14 out of a crew of 16, so they got almost everybody. The captain went down with the ship. Or let us say the captain was never found. Some people said he went down with the ship, but people later on said that, um, you know, he had too much to live for. He was probably there on the vessel just trying to get more people off at the last couple of minutes. And so this was one of the interviews I really enjoyed. That book will be out this winter. It's called New England Coast Guard Stories, Remarkable Mariners. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I think I've tried to bring 
something about the health of the river improvements are being considered and being funded. Well, I brought a little history, I hope, uh, talking about Coast Guard women and also Henry David Thoreau. And we'll talk again next week at this time about life along the Merrimack. Thank you very much.